Welcome to the Twimmel AI Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. Hey, what's up, everyone? I recently attended the AWS reInvent conference in Las Vegas, and I'm excited to share a few of my many interesting conversations from that event here on the podcast this week. Before we dive in, I'd like to thank our friends at Capital One for sponsoring our reInvent series. Capital One has been a huge friend and supporter of this podcast for some time now, and I'm looking forward to sharing my interview with Dave Castillo, Capital One's Managing VP of Machine Learning with you on Thursday. Dave and I discussed the unique approach being taken at the company's Center for Machine Learning, as well as some of the interesting AI use cases being developed at the bank and the platform they're building to support their ML and AI efforts. Once again, check back in on Thursday, December 19th for that conversation. To learn more about Capital One's machine learning and AI efforts and research, visit CapitalOne.com slash tech slash explore. And now, on to the show. All right, everyone, I am on the line with Brighton Shang. Brighton is the founder and CEO at Aquabyte. Uh, Brighton, welcome to the Twimmel AI podcast. Yeah, thank you and great to be here. Awesome. So you just spoke at the reInvent Machine Learning Summit earlier this week on a really interesting topic and one that we have not covered on the podcast before, uh, the application of deep learning to fish farming, uh, essentially. I'm really interested in diving into the topic, but you know, how did you get started working in this area? Yeah, it's a bit of an unusual story. So for context, the company Aquavite, we build software for fish farms, and it's a camera-based software. So the camera goes in the fish pen, it takes pictures of the fish, and then using computer vision and machine learning algorithms, we process those images to be able to determine things such as the weight of the fish, the health of the fish, how hungry the fish is, and then ultimately the farm buys us as a subscription service. And so it's this idea of uh, bringing machine learning and computer vision, which is very well understood in other industries and bringing it to fish farming. Now, the whole idea, I mean, I, so I grew up in Ithaca, New York, um, actually right by Cornell. And one of our family friends was a professor of aquaculture there. Then I ended up going to Princeton, I studied operations research and financial engineering, which is basically like data science and machine learning. And then after that, pretty much since university, I've been starting various companies. I started an algorithmic trading firm. I also was a CTO of another company that was doing deep learning for cancer detection. And then 2017, I started Aquabyte. And the idea was to bring the same machine learning and computer vision technologies to fish farming. And for those who uh, fish farming, maybe not as well known in the U.S., but actually is is the main way we get fish. Like over half of the fish we consume is farmed. It's not grown in the ocean. And so the idea being these 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 fish, imagine they grow in these massive pens. We don't really know how they grow. We don't know how much to feed them. We don't know a lot of things. And so be able to bring basic insight to the farmers using computer vision machine learning is is really really like a game changer for them and so and i can share more about the progression of the company and and how we progress but now we're selling to these salmon farmers in norway that are using it to count sea lice estimate the weight of their fish most of our engineering teams in san francisco but but we we actually start selling with the salmon farms in in norway because 99 percent of the industry is international well, how did you identify the opportunity? Was it serendipity? You met someone who was uh, interested in, in or working in aquaculture and you recognized the opportunity uh, through those conversations or were you, did you, were you actively kind of searching for mm. places to apply ML and AI and you came across this, this particular opportunity? Well, generally I've been working in the space in different companies and conceptually I had an idea of, well, to be able to process images and to be able to use that to deliver some insight, that paradigm, the idea for fish farming. So I mentioned that I I grew by Cornell, but also my old co-founder, 
one of his classmates had owned a fish farm and I had heard about it from him. And then kind of one thing led to another. I was reading papers on how they were using cameras to size fish and then ended up at the time incubating this out of a venture capital firm. So they had given me some money with the idea of me coming up with a new machine learning powered startup. And, and this was one of the ideas I looked into. And then one thing led to another and then built out a simple prototype and, and then raised some capital. So it, it was a bit of serendipity, but it was also the experience of having worked in these other industries and seeing the parallels between, I mean, even something as foreign as like algorithmic trading, it's conceptually similar because you're processing data in real time that's coming in. And instead of deciding whether to buy or sell stocks, you're just deciding how much to feed your fish or what action to take. And so conceptually, these mental models uh, are applicable between different industries. Uh, and so you, you mentioned talking a little bit more about the evolution of the company. Where did you start when, once you identified the problem? So I started by building a simple prototype. Okay. So I actually talked about this at the ML Summit, but I started literally in my apartment bathtub. So I built a simple rig, filled the bathtub with water, got some robotic fish off of Amazon. I was going to say, did you <laughs> load some salmon <laughs> into your bathtub? <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. Yeah, I don't know if it would fit, but um, yeah, certainly like these tiny robotic fish that would swim around and, and, and it worked. Like uh, the, the camera could actually determine the length of the robotic fish and, and the proportions of the fish correlate to the weight. It's just something that biologists know. And so then kind of the, the, the concept was proven. And then the idea was, okay, now I need to go from my bathtub to the ocean where it's rough conditions, where it's limited connectivity, where it's not just these robotic fish, but you have live fish with behavior, minds of their own, different environmental conditions. Yeah and a lot of practical concerns. And that was really kind of 27, 2018 was building the first prototypes for the ocean, getting a camera there, actually finding the fish farmers. So I don't know how many folks in the US know fish farmers, but like, again, 99% outside the US. And so imagine kind of I mean, me in Silicon Valley, but going to Norway to talk to these fish farmers, find them, convince them that this is like the next idea. And then start working with them. And so yeah. actually ended up living in Norway for a number of months and, and certainly traveling back and forth since then. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. I've seen some fish farms in Asia and, you know, what I remember of them, particularly when the fish are being fed and, you know, this may be the kind of the anomaly but it was just chaos. Like, you know, uh -huh. it wasn't like a few robotic fish in a bathtub. It was like, the, you know, the density, you know, per square meter of fish or of uh, ocean was very, very high. It strikes me as a very challenging environment to do computer vision. I think it is quite challenging. I think it also depends on what type of fish are growing in which environment. Okay. But to take an example in Norway by law, they cannot have more than two and a half percent of their pen be fish. Oh, wow. So, okay. So actually it's like, it, it, it is quite a lot of fish, but it's, uh, it's not like super packed. And so you're, you're, it's not like your fish are blocking your camera, but it is a very chaotic environment. You know, going back to the, the bathtub, you know, you, you found some success in, in kind of estimating the weight of your your robotic uh your robotic fish it strikes me yeah maybe talk a little bit more about the kind of the process or the challenges there you know for example even measuring the length of a fish without knowing its mm -hmm. distance from the camera um if you're just using the camera like how do you overcome those kinds mm -hmm. of issues right right so if you look at our website we have a picture of the camera it's a stereo camera so okay. with stereo, uh, kind of two parallel lenses, we can sense depth using using the disparity in the two images. Ah, okay. Now that it's it's a fairly straightforward geometric calculation to figure out. Kind of if I see the pixel in one image and the pixel in the other image, I can calculate the disparity and then use that to get the depth and then the three position and therefore calculate the length and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Now conceptually, this makes 
it's it's fairly straightforward. Now in practice, you you're dealing with a number of challenges. I'll just highlight a couple. For one, optics are slightly different in water. Water, you're dealing with light scattering, turbidity, essentially particles in the water that your photons, by the time they're hitting your lens, they're a bit distorted or they gotta they bounce off of different particles. And so to be able to get a, a very precise estimate is is more difficult underwater. Also, fish are shiny. They're, they're reflective. They're very specular. And so to be able to get good detail of that specific scale on one image versus another image and quit the distance, it's actually quite challenging versus something that's more te textured or that you can actually discern a lot of detail. Uh, they, they, these fish underwater, I mean, the scales look the same, so it's a bit more challenging. Also, uh, for, for those who've worked with camera-based systems, you need to calibrate them and the calibration can be a bit sensitive. And so there's a number of steps and to practical challenges that you need to work with from resolution to turbidity to calibration to specularity of the object to lighting. And a lot of this was us actually going out to the field, dropping a camera in the water, doing a lot of experimentation. Because a lot of this stuff you can calculate at a theoretical level, but until you put the the camera in the water and actually image the fish, you don't know if it's going to work or not. Mm -hmm. And and then compound that with this being at an actual fish farm, which is in the middle of the ocean, limited connectivity, literally like you got to take a boat to get out there. And so it's not as easy as taking your autonomous vehicle and driving it around town to get data. You need to really go through a lot of you literally need to go to a lot of practical challenges, get on a boat, go to Norway to actually do this type of research. But once you do it, then then we, we get the data, we're able to analyze it and actually deductively come to the best system. Uh, thus far, we've talked about deterministic approaches, geometry and optics and things like that. Where do machine learning and deep learning come into play? It's in the perception. So, for example, let's just take the example of we want to figure out the weight of a single fish. Yep. Now, now we know from the biologists that like, okay, if I get the length, then I can calculate the weight because like, like humans, like we grow, like the fish grow in proportions. And so you can get that. Now the actual detection of these points on the fish, you can imagine if we're doing this for thousands and thousands of fish a day, we're not going to just want, people to identify the points this is where the computer vision comes in where we have algorithms that can automatically detect key points on the fish and be able to then use that as inputs into the geometry to get the lengths and the fish weight and that those are essentially deep learning convolutional neural net based algorithms that can do detection of different key points and be able to do other things so I mean, something we'll talk a bit about later is like we determine the health of the fish. It's not just the weight. It's also the health of mm -hmm. the fish, particles in the water, food. Um, I don't want to spoil too much of the other applications. Maybe we'll talk about them later. But, but you can use computer vision as a lot of the perception input to these downstream algorithms. And we are using su some supervised algorithms to be able to do things such as determine the fish weight. Uh, well, before we leave the, the weight, you know, one aspect of this that strikes me as a bit counterintuitive, you know, when I think of a human's length or height and their weight, there's certainly a correlation, but I would think of the, our height as more correlated to age and our weight can kind of vary around mm -hmm. some, uh, midpoint pretty dramatically. Um, but that the, you know, our height obviously doesn't change accordingly. Um, you know, we don't grow a few inches after Thanksgiving and then take those <laughs> few inches off, uh, vertical inches at least, mm -hmm. you know, but what yeah. I'm hearing from you is that like, you're, you're inferring the, the weight largely on the length of the fish. Am I hearing that right? So to, to your point, we are, we are detecting a number of different points on the fish. So it's not just the length, it's the width, it's like. Okay. The eye to the fin to all these different points on the fish that then end up forming a 3D model of the fish to get the weight. Got it. You talked a little bit about the 
relative density of the fish in the farm, are you using your perception models to try to ident- like to create bounding boxes around multiple fish in an image, or are you throwing out images that have multiple fish? Do most of your images have single fish? You know, and how resilient are your models to the orientation of the fish? Like, are you trying to catch the fish at just the right moment? I would say like all of the above. <laughs> so, so if you look at one of the pic- underwater fish image pictures, so I, I have one in the presentation I was showing. Each one of these images has like 50 to 100 fish. Okay. So there's like a massive amount of fish. And as you pointed out, the fish is in every which direction. I mean, the fish generally, they school together. So if you put it parallel to the school of fish, you can get a nice side view. But there are some fish that are like facing the camera, away from the camera, or not in the right orientation, or there's there's too much light, or they're too dark, or whatever, the water's too blurry, and so the fish is too blurry. And so there, there does there, there, there needs to be some type of process by which we can filter the images and make sure we're getting the best fish to be analyzed. And that's really more an art than a science where that's where you're tweaking your hyperparameters to figure out what's the best trade-off between essentially precision and recall of a fish detector. Okay. Of a clear of a clear fish, and so whether you want more or less fish, and then if you want more fish, then it's less the the, the more the fish are less clear, but then you kind of figure out what's the optimal trade off to to get you the best result. And is the idea that if you're capturing kind of the again kind of sticking to 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 weight, and maybe this extends to health and some of the other things you're measuring, but is the idea that you are essentially computing some kind of average weight of all the fish or is it more trying to identify individual fish and track individual fish's Uh, weight or anything like that? Yes. So that's actually one of the more cool applications we're working on is fish facial recognition. As it turns out, the spots on the fish's face are unique. And so you can use it like a fingerprint to be able to uniquely identify that fish so you can imagine one of the questions you might ask, okay, how do you know if I saw the same fish twice? Like, how do I know if it swam by the camera twice? Well, you can know from this individual fish recognition. And so we are using that to track individual fish over time. And then there's some other interesting implications where you can use it, for example, in breeding to be able to find the best male, the best female fish and breed them together and to be able to do a lot more detailed analyses if you can know not just at a population level, but also at an individual level, how they're growing. And so we are working a lot on a lot of these other applications that are improving our weight estimation model, for example. Okay. Uh, That's awesome. Yeah. One of our most popular shows from last year was with uh, Jason Holmberg, who is the head of engineering, or was at the time, at uh, WildMe, which was applying um, kind of similar types of approaches to identifying, uh, uniquely identifying humpback whales. And he used the same kind of fingerprint analogy based on their uh, patterns and, and markings. Wow, that's, that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I know that there are, I mean, the, even WACV 2020, they're holding... Uh, a uh, specific section on animal re-identification. So I know there's e- even like specific conferences that are focusing on this. Interesting. And so you are, you know, maybe back to kind of the fundamental use case, you you describe this, uh, I forget what you said, 6,000. I forget if that was like images per day or uh, fish per day or something like that. But the, the picture that you've created for me is that you've got this online real time application that's constantly taking pictures of fish and, you know, identifying their weight and health and, uh, hunger levels, things like that. And 
what I guess one of my fundamental questions is like, do we need to know the real time health of the fish? Like, uh-huh. where does it, you know, I, I imagine that before that, someone would like take a boat out to the pen, you know, once a week and sample a few fish and kind of get a sense for how they were doing. Uh, mm. You know, where does that fall short? Well, so to give you a sense, let's let's take a typical salmon pen in Norway. It's about half a football field in diameter. You could submerge an entire 737 in the pen. These are like massive pens. The single pen has anywhere from 100,000 to 200,000 fish. Okay. So you're not going to get a representative sample if you just take a sample of even 100 fish. Mm-hmm. You, you, you need to get some representative part of the population. Now combine that with the other fact that these fish, they're growing one to two percent every day just be, uh, like uh, of their own body weight after oh wow eat. okay so they're growing pretty quickly and so you want to be able to sample enough every day such that you get an accurate weight and also see a represented enough population okay so i mean for and, and the other thing is for us again because these farms are in the middle of the ocean it's not like we're sending these images back to the cloud to get processed. It's just like too much data. And so the trade-off of, of processing more images is just computing power. And because it is local at the farm, the computing happens for free. So we're, we would like to process as many fish as we can. I'm interested in exploring the, the form factor of your computing system a little bit do you have like a floating data center that is doing Mm -hmm. uh, a floating kind of inference engine it's all on camera so if you look at our camera it it has the lenses the camera sensor there's also a computer on board microprocessor that's processing the images on in inside the camera in underwater so we're doing all that compute there okay and then it attaches to whatever switch or power it has, and then and then they can see all the information coming off the camera. Got it. And for one of these typical pens, how many cameras are located there? It's a single camera that navigates around the pen. Okay. And, and navigates uh, like yeah. around the edges or like some kind of autonomous thing? Uh, or yeah. Like a, Roomba, so, a Roomba fish counter camera? <laughs> so it, it could be. Typically, so the cameras in fish pens are not new things. They actually already have them for monitoring feeding of the fish. So they, they, they typically have cameras on winches. So they're essentially on rope and pulley systems that they, they move throughout the pen. Okay. So it is moving. And then how you want to sample that is is a more complicated question, but could be autonomous if the farmer wants that. But a lot of times the farmer doesn't want like an autonomous moving thing. They want to be able to like, because it, it becomes a liability if it can like move in and hit things or whatever. So you mentioned some of the other use cases beyond the weight, one of them being counting sea lice. What's that one about? So sea lice is this parasite. It's a naturally occurring parasite that attaches to the fish it weakens the immune system and eventually kills the fish. In Norway, for example, it's about 25% of the cost of running the farm. Now, these farms, they need to count sea lice as a part of the legally running a farm because essentially their version of the FDA in Norway requires them to sample sea lice every week from all their pens. Okay. So the typical process is fairly tedious. So you've got to send someone out to the pen. They're netting some fish. Then they anesthetize each fish and then count the sea lice by hand. And they have to do this week over week over week. Now, the idea being we can make this process a lot simpler for farmers with the same camera footage, be able to identify the sea lice on the fish and then be able to quantify this into a system that then the farmers could use to manage sea lice infestations. Now, the cool thing is actually in Norway, we are the first company and I think still the only company where you can apply to have our technology as a replacement for manual counting. And this is saving the farmers a lot of effort in terms of being able to count the sea lice and get accurate counts. Yeah, you mentioned that 25% of the cost of running the farm is dealing with this sea lice issue. Is that 
25%, does that come from the cost of doing the sampling and all that? Or is that 25% of your fish die because of sea lice? Oh, well, it's a combination of mortality. So the fish die, but the fish die from the sea lice, but also from the treatments to the fish. They, they mm. treat the fish for sea lice, and it's a very stressful process. Essentially, it's like a, it's essentially like a large washing machine that the fish need to go into to get rid of the sea lice. So this is a very stressful process, kills the fish. Also, the fish, when they're diseased, well, they're just like weaker, and they, they, they eat less, and they're more susceptible. So it's, it's, it's a really challenging problem and and it's mandated by law because if the infestations get too high then they start to infect the wild fish and that's mm-hmm. that 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 cannot happen and so they they need to keep the sea lice levels low and if the infestations increase then then they need to treat it which is stressful kills more fish and the treatments themselves are quite expensive so overall it's a very very challenging thing to manage and especially because they don't actually know the true state of the infestation. So what the farmers are doing is because they have the more accurate numbers, they can then forecast infestation levels and then figure out the optimal time to treat the fish and ultimately reduce the number of treatments and improve the overall welfare of the fish. And are those models that you're developing and providing for the farmers or do the farmers already have ways to project the intensity of infestations? They have rudimentary models, but we're providing a lot more sophisticated models to them to be able to forecast the infestation patterns. Cool. And so going back to the um, the computer vision elements of this, uh, can you, you know, how, how would you describe the general approach or models that you're using. And and I'm curious about things like, you know, to what degree are you able to take off the shelf computer vision models, you know, trained on uh, things like ImageNet, for example, and apply transfer learning, or are you, you know, basically starting from scratch, you know, with, you know, known models, or are you kind of inventing your own things? Like, like how, um, how complex are the models that you're fielding to solve these problems? We were able to transfer learn, as you mentioned, a pre-trained model and train it specifically to identify fish. Then, then you kind of want to go. So, so previous uh, in the show, you had mentioned, well, kind of what if the fish is in the wrong orientation or if it's too blurry, it's too dark, then you want to start tuning your model to those nuances. Mm -hmm. And that's where, we when we detect the fish, uh, if the detector has a low confidence, we can annotate those examples with low confidence to be able to improve the model. And so we are we 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 have done annotation to be able to improve the model, and the transfer learning techniques have worked well for us to be able to, for example, fish detection. Now now that's a relatively simple model. Now let's talk about more complicated models. So for example, let's just say I want to detect the different points on a fish. Mm-hmm. And, and so first thing you might try is to be able to do a segmentation of the fish. Um, so like you get an outline of the fish uh, and then figure out a depth mapping of the fish. So every single point, what is the distance? And then overlay that to get a 3D model. Mm-hmm. Now... That works, but then you run into like more complicated problems in terms of fish orientation, and you're only maybe seeing like half of the fish. And then um, maybe it's hard to explain, but sometimes the fish is not clear and you're not getting a good mapping. And so it's then starting to do some filtering and, and tuning of the model to make sure that it can work in all these different edge cases. Okay. I think another thing um that has been an inspiration is let's just say that um you want to look at uh different poses of the fish so maybe the fish is straight maybe it's curved and you can use those like pose estimation techniques to be able to determine uh the orientation of your fish and consequently use that to inform which type of fish you're accepting and which type of re- you're rejecting and what type of weight model to use. So it can get like fairly, fairly complicated. I, I think 
the computer vision honestly is maybe like five to ten percent of it like 90 to 95 percent of it is the type of data you're collecting and so we've mm -hmm. made a massive investment in terms of act establishing over half our team in norway and that's because you 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 can't have a team of computer vision engineers, machine learning engineers in San Francisco, just getting a clean data set like to, to train the model. A lot of it is like practically going at the farms, collecting the data, getting the right type of data um, and getting it annotated. And that is just like the devils in the details about like actually getting and, and, and actually physically going out and do the work. And that's that is like 90, 95% of it. Once the data is in a good state, then it's relatively straightforward to train your model. And what's been your approach to annotation? Do you do that in-house or do you do something like a mechanical Turk or something in between where it's you know a little bit more curated to, to your particular use case? So it depends. Uh, some of the annotations we do are more general. So identify the fish, that, that's not that specialized. Now, when you're identifying a sea lice, and I wanted you to differentiate it into the eight different stages of sea lice, which are millimeters in size, well, that requires some special marine biology background. And so we work with marine biology marine biologists in Norway to help us identify the sea lice. Um, but for the simpler stuff like fish, we're able to outsource those annotations to services, as you mentioned. So you, you, you described the, the key challenge as the key challenge as being the type of data that you're able to produce. What's the, the nuance around type or if there is one, is it, you know, it's, it sounds like it's not just the volume of data, you know, there's the annotations, of course, and the quality of those annotations. Are there other aspects like qualitative aspects of the data collection that have been important to your ability to solve this problem? Or am I reading too much into that? <laughs> uh, I, I think, um, and it's, it's like, it's all sorts of things that you wouldn't expect. It's like, for example, does like, there's a bunch of metadata that's quite interesting. Like, like does the breed of the fish matter in terms of your weight model? Like maybe different breeds have different morphologies, have different weights. Does the type of environment and environmental conditions affect your model? Uh, there, there's a bunch of different, other types of metadata and confounding factors that could affect your ultimate model. And so being able to test it in a wide variety of conditions is, is also a key part of solving the problem. And I think that is really the secret sauce in all of this is that we just like spent two years banging our heads against the wall in terms of trying out every single condition and like drilling down into like even the, the most minute factors to understand all the different variables that might affect the problem and investigating it because chances are like it's, it's all again all of the above like yes the breed affects the way of the fish the the type the time of year affects the the way of the fish because well um the the time of the year affects the runoff to the oceans and the runoff affects the the turbidity underwater and the turbidity underwater affects what sizes of fish you can see and therefore it affects the weight. And it's, it's things mm. like that, that you would have never <laughs> imagined wow. yeah. cascading effects yeah. and to be able to investigate all those effects to figure out. And, 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 and again, this cannot, can just, this, this isn't going to be figured out by a computer scientist, machine learning scientist in San Francisco. This is talking to tons of actual fish farmers in Norway and fish biologists who actually, know this stuff and can can say oh that well that's probably why the reason why the model's not working and so that's the type of qualitative insight that's invaluable how readily would you expect or have you seen the models that you've developed for the norwegian fish farms to translate to a fish farm in asia for example i think well, I, I would say like between uh, within a species, it's fairly transferable because the uh, water's the water and the fish are fish. So 
actually we we have our model that estimates for salmon it actually just worked out of the box for trout um now when you start going to asia asia they're growing fish in ponds and the ponds are well they're they're, they're muddy and you can't really see the fish that well and so there maybe optics is not the best solution maybe you want some type of acoustic device but it's really more condition it's really more dependent on the type of fish and the condition it's grown in but if you're going just like from the same species from one geography to the other i don't think there's as much difference of the many different use cases that you've mentioned you know weight health hunger we talked about you know the sea lice we, these are all ones that we right. talked about and you suggested that there are others and i'm wondering you know before we close out are there others that are worth mentioning uh, because they introduce different types of techniques or approaches that you've had to work with? Yes. So the holy grail of fish farming is a fully autonomous fish farm. Mm -hmm. I'll explain the reason why. So right now, the way fish farms are run is that you need people to go there. So that's why you look at most of the fish farms, they're along the coastline. They're in places like Norway, in places like Chile where they have long coastlines. Now, just at a macro macro level, like the earth is 70% water. We only produce about 5% of the world's protein from the oceans. And so there, there's a massive potential there, but it requires us to have fully autonomous fish farms that can be in the deep ocean or that can be on land. And that requires a lot more automation. Now, the weight estimation, for the first time, the farmer can understand the growth of the fish and use that to benchmark the feeding of the fish. Now, now feeding is about half of the cost of running a farm. If you can start to optimize the feeding, essentially by running lots of A-B tests to be able to optimize the feeding and create an optimal feeding policy, that is the real holy grail of fish farming. Now, the way you do that, there's, there's biological models you can use for feeding. You can also think of other machine learning based model, for example, uh, reinforcement based learning model where you learn the policy that is the best for optimally feeding the fish. And I think that for us is like a really, really motivating factor and one of the really, really cool applications that's coming down the pipeline. Well, Brighton, thanks so much for taking the time to share with us what you're up to. Very cool stuff. Yeah, thanks. It is great to chat about it as well. All right, everyone, that's our show for today. To follow along with our reInvent series, visit twimmelai.com slash reInvent2019. Thanks once again to Capital One for their sponsorship of this series. Be sure to check out CapitalOne.com slash tech slash explore to learn more about their ML and AI research. Thanks so much for listening and catch you next time.